uh, through the preventive mechanisms, uh, the threat of terrorism has been very comforting. The second thing I would say, and it's in short-term memory, but it's history nonetheless, at the time of Desert Shield and before Desert Storm, uh, there were repeated uh, <coughs> encouragements by uh, Saddam Hussein to take the war to the aggressor. And I took those at that time, and everybody knows I did, as potential threats of terrorism in the United States. Uh, we were at uh, peak efficiency. The, uh, the sharing of intelligence internationally, the work of uh, all these agencies you see before you here, uh, meant that we were, in fact, prepared for it, and it did not happen. And uh, the interdictive capability uh, through the, the use of the intelligence, through the cooperation of the American people, all these factors make it possible for law enforcement to carry out its responsibility. And there is no reason I know of to suggest that any of those factors do not exist right now. You're basically saying, uh, let me ask the question this way, is it that there have been f fewer attempts or more attempts, and I don't mean actual success or even getting a bomb in a car, but people trying to come to America for these kinds of political purposes, and it's that our law enforcement is much better at it than we were ten years ago. In other words, is it that we are less a focal point, or is it that we're just as much a focal point, but your efforts and your agencies, the, the efforts of the other agencies, have made us more successful in thwarting those who would come here for those, for those types of terrible uh, um, actions? Uh, maybe the answer to your question, or part of it, lies in the chart again on the left. If you take and add up the column of terrorist incidents in any one year, and the preventions in any one year, uh, those first two columns on the left, you can right. see a combination of events of uh, both reactive capability to the effects, to the events that happen, and the prevention. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think law enforcement is better. I, I mentioned, for instance, in my written testimony, uh, the Trevi Conference on Terrorism in, in Europe, where the ministers of justice and interior gather every six months, and the working groups behind those continually work, not only to deal with terrorism, but to plan for how we will react to share intelligence, to share training, to share these things which will allow us as a community working together to actually prevent the acts that are, are uh, were in such, uh, uh, such right. uh, well, there were so many of them. Let so, me ask you this. Um, do, we, do we have to be concerned about terrorism from different kinds of groups than the groups that have tried this traditionally in the past. Drug cartels, for instance, um, perhaps uh, domestic religious groups like the one in Waco, Texas. Um, what's your view of that? Well, we my, live in such a changing world. Um, my view is that we have to be very, very careful uh, lest we ascribe uh, certain tendencies to a particular group. Uh, I can remember over the years that uh, certain uh, new groups in this country were were supposedly suspect groups uh, and went through uh, as an ethnic group a great trial and tribulation simply on account of their ethnicity and we should not do that. Mm -hmm. I think what has to guide us is what are their activities? What right. are they doing? What are they doing? Mm -hmm. What do they intend to do? What are, the, what are their motives and, and their, their claims? So that we look at all these things and then decide whether under our very tight Attorney General guidelines, whether under the policy of the United States uh, we can, in fact, deal with that particular activity of that particular person or group of persons. Right. I know that uh, the way the Justice Department works, you're not allowed to comment on specific legislation such as we have uh, introduced. Uh, and we're waiting, of course, for an attorney general um, who should be here hopefully Thank shortly um, so that we can get on with that. But let me just ask you in general terms, um, What's your view of, of, of uh, what we can do to reduce our vulnerability further in the areas of explosives, in the area of immigration, in the area of new types of potential criminal statutes? Uh, generally speaking, Mr. Chairman, I, in the area of explosives, I would refer to the expert on my left, Steve Higgins, who is uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms uh, Director. In the area of immigration, I would refer to the Immigration and Naturalization Service in the Department of State. I read the proposed legislation that you have, and I know that there are parts of it uh, that the FBI has previously supported and previously evidenced a strong interest in it. So I would expect 
uh, that we will make those views known to the Department of Justice and that there will be a, a reaction by the Department of Justice. Um, Director Higgins or perhaps Mr. Brown, would you talk a little bit about uh, the explosives part? I noticed an earlier question when someone talked about could you, how easy was it to go in and buy dynamite yes. and I was, I was thinking at the time and obviously fought uh, a lot in the past, uh, you can go in and buy dynamite in many states as easily as you can go in and buy a gun. Uh, you fill out a form. No restrictions. And limited restrictions. You fill out mm -hmm. a form and, and state right. that you're an eligible uh, person. I think if, you're, if the committee is looking for things they might consider, you might want to look at some of the things that you're considering doing with respect to the gun area, with uh, increased identification, whether or not you want to have a waiting period. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a balance between uh, inconveniencing the industry and you have to weigh that, but I think many of the, uh, uh, the thoughts might, might be the same, so I think you should look in that area. Uh, Taggants, you may have some questions on. I'll be happy. I, I think. Well, why don't you address the issue of Taggants? Uh, is there any dispute? I know we've had some opposition ten years ago when we tried this from, of course, our friends at the NRA. Um, uh, do you know anyone who, aside from people from the NRA, who dispute the fact that Taggants would be a useful tool in law enforcement? Well, since I don't know everyone, I won't give you an answer to that no, question. I just... But I, I. Uh, I brought with me, as a matter of fact, uh, back in the late 70s when we were looking at Taggins, we were actually looking at two types, as you'll recall. We were looking at a type of uh, post-blast Taggins. We call right. that a detection Taggins that, that would seep out and could be detected uh, by certain types of uh, uh, machines, and that would be helpful in trying to prevent bombings before they occur. We also type, talked at that time about uh, some types of uh, microchips in which we would code some identifying information with respect to when a particular explosives was was made and who made it and this was the the mock-up of the of the chip that we used that time obviously this could be uh, microscopic and not this large but this would go into explosives and it would be helpful in the identification for post blast uh, and you would go in and could recover this in fact we had a, on one occasion a test of this and we found in one bombing that this had been used. So it also might serve as a deterrent to those who were going to use explosives, I would imagine. I think that knowledge would be helpful. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, the uh, director, uh, Director Sessions again. Uh, what information, one of the things that's troubling lots of people uh, here is um, the activities of Sheikh Rahman in terms of, not in terms of a link to this crime, which hasn't been established yet, but the fact that he was on a particular uh, watch list in, in the country for almost two years after his tourist visa expired. Um, did the FBI know that he was on the State Department's uh, terrorist list and was linked or potentially linked to the assassination of Anwar Sadat? Sadat? I mean, what was your... What kind of intelligence information did you have on the Sheikh? We're trying to determine why it's taking so long for the legal process to uh, um, remove him. I think two years is a little bit long when somebody's on the known terrorist list. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I know that's not your jurisdiction, but uh, we're well, not saying. Well, respectfully, uh, we're in the middle of uh, of an investigation. I think it would be, uh, with all due respect, inappropriate for me to comment about those things. It, it may be that we did know that he was on that list. I would think, secondly, that it, uh, that question as to whether or not he was on such a list and what actions have been taken might be directed at the Immigration and Naturalization Service yeah. to answer more fully. There's just nobody home there right now, but we will yeah. have follow-ups uh, on that Thank issue. You, How about state? Could you answer that, Mr. McNamara? It's your list. Well, the, uh, the case of, the, of Sheikh uh, Omar Abdulman, uh, he was issued a visa in 1990 in error uh, by our embassy in Khartoum. Tourist visa. Uh, he was issued a tourist visa, correct? And what was the error? The error was that uh, he had, in one or another transliteration of his name, uh, been placed on a list of uh, a lookout list. The, uh, Could you describe the, the lookout list for us? The lookout list would contain the names of people who uh, are suspected of being uh, involved in uh, either terrorist activities, uh, any types of illegal activities uh, overseas, such as drug uh, trafficking or organized crime. Uh, it would also include uh, individuals who've been involved in, uh, in violence. Uh, the Sheikh had been uh, arrested and tried in the case of uh, the assassination of Anwar Sadat. And he had subsequently also been uh, involved in, 
in some uh, illegal activities in Egypt. Uh, we do not have a record uh, explaining why the visa was issued, except back at that time, uh, we did not have the automated system that we have right now for the transmittal of names. And indeed, we still have the problem of uh, transliteration of names from Arabic into English, so that wide spell variety, differently. Pardon? You mean widely spelled? differing spellings can occur. Uh, without saying why it happened, the visa was issued in error. When it was discovered... Uh, and how was it discovered? It was discovered uh, in New York after the uh, Sheikh had arrived there. Uh, and, uh, was and that was two days after? So no, I think it was some time a... after. Uh, he arrived in the U.S. in late July of 1990, and we revoked his visa in November of 1990. Uh, the revocation of the visa uh, meant that he would have to leave the United States fairly soon thereafter. Uh, the... The fact is that in Could April... you just, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just no, want to get this all down. How did you discover the fact that he had come here? Was it, is this routine? Everyone is checked or checked through a second process? Did someone alert you to it? No, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I'll get that for you. I believe you that we were alerted to, to it. There's no follow-up uh, okay. no follow okay, after they continue. come in. Uh, the, the Sheikh then uh, appears to have moved his residence to, uh, from Brooklyn to New Jersey, where he applied uh, to the INS uh, under a different name for a permanent residence status in April of 1991. The name was Omar Ali, uh, which is part of his name, but which is not the critical element of his name. The INS office in New Jersey, in Newark, uh, issued him uh, a green card, that is permanent resident alien status. This status was revoked in March of 1992 by the INS. At that point, or shortly thereafter, uh, the Sheikh applied for political asylum. That case uh, is still pending in the uh, immigration court. Uh, the asylum hearing, uh, he has had two of them, and we are waiting for a decision by the judge uh, in the case. The last hearing was on January 20th of 1992. There has not yet been a decision. Okay. So in other words, to sum it up, while you were in the process of de deportation, he asked for political asylum, and that is the process that has extended and taken things as long That's, as they have. That is what is now under, uh, under examination. Okay. Mr. Fox, let me ask you this, and this will be my last one. I have a few more, and I'll try to come back, but I want to give my colleagues a chance. Uh, you were uh, quoted on CNN last night as saying that it was your gut feeling that a large terrorist organization was behind the bombing. Could you explain that a little more to us? I think that's all it is, Chairman. The feeling, those of us who have worked uh, terrorism and counterintelligence matters for many years, from the first day you see uh, an incident such as we have here, you develop certain feelings and uh, suggestions and you talk among yourselves, the old professionals, the tough old veterans at the office. And I think uh, from, from early on, we were reluctant to say this was a bombing, but it was a bombing. Right. From early on, we were reluctant to say this is a terrorist incident, but now there's a lot of evidence that leads us to suspect it was a terrorist incident. And uh, in the talk among the old veterans, uh, that's the way they're talking, that this is a terrorist incident organized by a, a large, uh, well-known terrorist group. A well-known terrorist group. Um, might I ask you if, if you've had experience with this group before? No, and I, let me say, we aren't saying it's this particular group. I understand. Group. We that's are why saying, I didn't ask that question. Okay, thank you. It's a gr we're saying it, it's a group that knows what they're doing and perhaps not a bunch of ad hoc terrorists okay, coming that was my next, large. That was my next and last question. Um, again, we all read the newspapers, watch television, and given our proximity to this, we, we just speculate among ourselves with far less intelligence and ability than you do. But what you're saying is if you had to... At one end of the scale is sort of an amateur group that sort of bumbled into this, and the other is a professional group that really knew what you, they were doing. You would put it at the end, the professional end of the scale. That's right, Truman. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask some questions of Ambassador McNamara on how Sheikh Omar Rahman got his visa to begin with. Uh, he applied for a tourist visa, and as is the case with all non-immigrant visas, uh, the applicant uh, must overcome a presumption of intending immigrancy. 
uh, by showing ties to his homeland and the like. Um, since Sheikh Rahman spent most of his life in Egypt and applied in the Sudan, uh, 